Motion shot. Thank you, Frank. I think back to a dinner we had probably 20 years ago before Bilbao and other great events. And I remember saying to you, I'm sort of fiddling or trying to fiddle with Bach and Mozart. And where are you, Frank? Here. And you're into Schoenberg and Stockhausen. And what a journey it's been and how liberating for all of us. So, thank you. I want to talk today about things that are sort of preoccupying me, maybe obsessing me, and I brought them down to three terms, or three words, scale, complexity, and beauty. Scale in the sense that it seems to me that everything around us is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And building types are changing, and hospitals, and footprints of office buildings are becoming one acre, two acres. Probably 90% of all people today work in offices where they don't even come close to a window. There is a kind of an oppression of scale. And that constant growth of size is really creating what I feel is a very human environment. And the question of how we deal with that seems to me to be very central. Uh, in, I'd like to quote something of our esteemed colleague Ram Koolhaas from his mega scale book, where he says, the proper response to mega density, the only response that, that works is neither resistance nor nostalgia, but wholehearted embrace. In the face of apocalyptical demographies and the seeming failure of the urban, we have to dare to be utterly uncritical. It would require a second innocence to believe at the end of the 20th century that the urban, the built, can be planned and mastered. Too many architects' visions have bitten the dust to propose this new addition to chimerical battalion. Utterly uncritical. And it seems to me that one of the issues is, can I have the, one of the issues is that faces us is how do we deal with mega scale? How do we deal with the questions of the possibility of intervention to make that which is big more comfortable, more livable, more bearable. Some, yesterday in one of the presentations, we were told that the net is gonna make communities work and it's gonna save family life. That's being uncritical. Octavio Paz said, the market knows prices. The market does not know values. Some years ago, I was asked to design the campus for the superconducting supercollider in Waxahachie, Texas. 3,000 physicists had converged on that site to come close to a window. There is a kind of an oppression of scale. And that constant growth of size is really creating what I feel is a very human environment. And the question of how we deal with that seems to me to be very central. Uh, in, I'd like to quote something of our esteemed colleague Ram Koolhaas from his mega scale book, where he says, the proper response to mega density, the only response that, that works is neither resistance nor nostalgia, but wholehearted embrace. In the face of apocalyptical demographies and the seeming failure of the urban, we have to dare to be utterly uncritical. It would require a second innocence to believe at the end of the 20th century that the urban, the built, can be planned and mastered. Too many architects' visions have bitten the dust to propose this new addition to Chimerical Battalion. Utterly uncritical. And it seems to me that one of the issues is, can I have the, one of the issues is, that faces us is how do we deal with mega scale? How do we deal with the questions of the possibility of intervention to make that which is big more comfortable, more livable, more bearable? Some yesterday in one of the presentations, we were told that the net is gonna make communities work and it's gonna save family life. 
that's being uncritical. Octavio Paz said, the market knows prices. The market does not know value. Some years ago, I was asked to design the campus for the superconducting supercollider in Waxahachie, Texas. 3,000 physicists, ha physicists had converged on that site and were working away at the greatest ex physical experiments of all time. And when I arrived, to my surprise, I found them all housed in the largest Sea Robux warehouse ever built, several acres in size, totally windowless. They were all there in their 10 by 10 cubicles. When I came in and I said who I needed to see, I was offered a bicycle and a map. And, you know, we worked on it for some years. It's, sorry, back. I'm, I'm afraid we can't see much, but can we go back on that one, reverse? Reverse, reverse. Back one. Thank you. Well, there is a, there is a pond, is it too? There is a pond here, a pooling pond. You can't see it, I, I'm afraid. But there's a pooling pond which cools the physics, the, 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 uh, the, the detectors. There are the labs and the offices. There's a meeting place where the uh, restaurants and cafeterias and libraries. This was all about interaction, about bringing physicists together. But what was fascinating was the discussion with the Department of Energy that insisted that the temporary buildings were appropriate and that they actually consisted, constituted reasonable working space for the physicists. So it is always a struggle with size. This is Mamela in Jerusalem, a million and a half square feet of space, uh, thousands of parking spaces next to the old city. It connects the old city and the new city. It connects the Israeli part with the Arab part. It's meant to bridge but it is all for me about dealing with scale, to restore the natural topography, to break down size, to create, to try and create a sense of place in what was, what is overwhelming in its size. Columbus Center some years ago, three million square feet in the heart of New York. How do you take a large building of many uses and again break it down? How do you relate it to the street? How do you articulate the various parts? How do you create uh, amenities within the building, and so on and so forth. And if I go back to Habitat and reflect, the whole metaphor of garden, the whole notion of for everyone a garden, had to do with the idea that though we get to build more densely, though we get to build in larger scale, the dream of the paradise garden can be attained. And it seems to me that that is still the most difficult thing we have to deal with. New city of Modi'in in Israel, uh, built, master planned by us over many years, actually built, designed by many architects. How do we create the spine of a community to create a place with schools and shops and so on, allow the community to come together? How to reinvent the whole idea of street as it was constituted in the 19th century? And how to actually take what is a extraordinarily high density and make it a place of more humane habitation. My preoccupation with complexity has to do basically with the notion, with the, with the sense that somehow we have come to distrust anything that does not give us a sense of complexity. If I was speaking 10, 15 years ago, I have the feeling that we might be talking about minimalism, that we might be talking about reduc reductionism. But we have today a kind of suspicion about things simple. And we have the feeling that we must seek for a sense of complexity. And yet, as I explore in my buildings this question, I try to understand what is the deeper meaning of complexity. Uh, in, a, in a wonderful book by Ian Stewart about uh, uh, the forms of living forms, the, the new, new meaning of living forms, there are diagrams about speculations about the spatial order in string theory of the smallest particles in physics. There are diagrams that demonstrate the sense of complexity in organic forms that is resultant from the forces of 
the survival sense of these organisms. There, there is the examples, for example, of the spider's web, uh, where the process of the mating, gravity and so on, uh, create uh, incredible complexity. And today, the best example was the colliding nebula. What could be more beautiful, more complex, and yet, in looking at it, we have the sense of the order of the laws of the rules which generated this incredibly complex set of forms. A few years ago, I was chosen to design uh, a science museum in Wichita, Kansas, along the Arkansas River. This is the site. And uh, the first thing that I observed as I started working on it is that the site was cut from the river uh, by McLean's Boulevard. And in fact, the museum would be built inland as it is divided from the river. So my first was proposal was, let's reroute McLean's, let's bring it around so that the building could really become part of the river. Sooner that I proposed it, I learned that the Friends of McLean's Boulevard had been formed. <laughs> and it turned out that for many of the residents of Wichita, the 20 seconds along the river are the highlight of the day. <laughs> it took many months, six months of public hearings to have McLean's rerouted. I came back and I showed slides to the building committee and I said, buildings can grow out of the water uh, like Majora. They, would, they will really connect uh, the river and, 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 and the building. They had aspirations that this building across the river from downtown would help rejuvenate downtown, that in fact this building had a role in the whole campaign that downtown should become once more a place. And one of my first sketches, I think we've missed one here. Can we go back one? I show them this slide as well of the Janta Manta Observatory because it seemed to me that this is the building whose complexity comes from the fact that it is an instrument. It's an astronomical instrument. The formal complexity has, so to speak, a kind of reason, deeper reason behind it. With my first sketch of cutting a channel of an island museum, an island in the river, and that with a first model of stringing the galleries in the river. And then I came back and made this proposal and they looked at me with kind of a disbelief and a smile and they said, it used to be an island, Ackerman Island, and we spent money during the depression filling it with wheelbarrows <laughs> to create jobs. <laughs> Moreover, it turned out to be the red light district at the time. Maybe it could fund the project. <laughs> <coughs> and then came other reactions, put, it, put part in the river, that part of the program should be on the mainland so that we don't turn our back to the neighborhood. And out of 50 models later came a scheme. And uh, to start with, one was fairly pleased with the scheme. There were a whole series of playgrounds and exhibits in the landscape and in Agora. There was a building on the mainland with the uh, Cyber Dome Theater and so on, an entry, and there was a series of bridges to the island building with its galleries, but this was to be a seductive building. Those who are cheap and don't want to pay could come, and rather than cross the bridge, they could go on the roof of the bridge, and they could come to the roof of the island, and then they could peek into the exhibit, they could even cross two bridges and see the exhibit, they'd get fascinated, come back down, go around, pay eight dollars and go inside. <laughs> However, though this was called schematic design and was about to be approved, I was very uneasy. And I was uneasy because I felt that the complexity in the building was capricious. That in fact, in some ways, I could have stopped anywhere. There were dozens and dozens of models. There we were and I just felt uneasy. I felt it did not have the kind of compelling quality of the Jantar Mantar Observatory I showed you earlier. And so I started thinking about perhaps some bigger idea could generate the building. 
And a physicist friend said to me, a physicist at Harvard who had actually been involved with a super collider, I mean, this building, in a sense, you should think about as a great receptor of, of stuff coming out of, from the cosmos or coming from deep in the earth. And so that led to a whole notion that the, the, the roof of the building should really become uh, the element which structures it and the idea of making the roof generated by this receiving geometry, out of, out of which grew the idea that the geometry of the island building should be generated by, the, by a toroid that has a center high in the sky and of the landside building with a toroid deep in the earth, the toroid being the surface of a donut or a bagel, depending on your cultural preference. <laughs> and so one could let the building evolve and the plans of the different galleries could respond to the various needs of the exhibit designers and so on. And then that plan, that geometry, would intersect the surface of the uh, toroid and that would generate the building's form. And everything started falling together. These walls, concrete walls, immediately became stiff buttresses uh, supporting the structure. And Ovar, the engineers I was working with, came up with the idea of making the structure itself of the roof, which is in tension out of laminated wood beams. And because it's a toroid, each and every of these beams was exactly the same radius. The whole thing came together, uh, even was on budget. And here is the building as it was when the model was finished. And of course, there were always these discussions about budget and so on and so forth. And I would say to the committee, don't complain, you're getting twice for your money. <laughs> the building opened last month, the channel cutting through in the river, uh, the playground as part of the park. We flow into the building, cross the bridge, overlooking downtown. As seen from the high-rise buildings downtown. And the building draws you in as you cross the bridge and the central space on the island facing onto the mainland. And the roofs are lit and they float. And as we come along the bicycle path which connects the whole bank of the river to the city, we actually drive right through the museum, looking in, looking across the entry, the wood beams in their convex form, and the galleries on the island with their concave form. And every time structure meets the concrete walls, light comes in, skylights stud the connection between the beams and the concrete walls. This is the aviation pavilion. And the only complaint is that people get seasick because the river is flowing. And as they stand, they think it's the building is moving. And uh, there's been little pills being given away. And then again at night, going through the bicycle path, looking from downtown, Many years ago, I was asked by Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, to design a memorial to the children who died in the Holocaust. Yad Vashem occupies an entire hillside. Uh, the historic museum today set on the hillside. And I was asked to make yet another building to commemorate the children. I spent days and weeks in the archives. They wanted me to use objects, paintings, clothing, dolls and so on and place another building on the hill. I felt very uneasy. I felt that people coming out of the historic museum as they proceed on their exit to the children's memorial would be saturated with information that they will not be able to absorb anymore. And so I made a counter proposal. My counter proposal, which I could tell you sat dormant for 10 years, was that we 
cut through a natural cave uh, in the hill onto an underground chamber. We would carve right into it, descending into this chamber. As we enter the antechamber, there are reflective, just reflections of photographs of children who died in the Holocaust. And then as you move into the principal chamber, you are in a vast space in which one single candle reflects into infinity in all directions millions of times as you pass through the space over a bridge floating through the candles, the names of the children being read, names, age, place of birth, the tape does not repeat a name in six months. And then you emerge to the north, to the light, and to life. The proposal sat there. <laughs> the proposal sat dormant for 10 years because the board of Yad Vashem said people will misunderstand. They will think it's a discotheque. They will think all kinds of things. And then one day a man, a man, Abe Spiegel from Los Angeles, who had lost his two-year-old son in Auschwitz, came, the box was there, uh, it had the optical arrangements, which I should say, these are the optical uh, uh, developments that was, were done by the National Film Board for Labyrinth, for the entrance to Labyrinth, Zurich Expo, using semi-reflective glass that can multiply an image uh, when properly arranged. He saw the model, he peeked inside, he wrote a check on the spot, and that's the way it got built. Two years ago, I was on one of my monthly brief trips to Israel, and I got a call from the foreign ministry, and they said, oh, how lucky you are, you're, uh, how lucky it is that you're in Israel. We have the chief minister of the state of Punjab here, Mr. Badil, and we've just taken him to Yad Vashem, and we took him to the children's memorial. And he weeped, and he demanded to meet the architect. That doesn't happen to you in life very often. And I rushed down to Tel Aviv, and there was Mr. Badel. Uh, he became my guru. Uh, he was defended by a number of fierce-looking fighters. And he said to me, uh, we Sikhs have suffered a great deal. You Jews have suffered. I was very moved by the Children's Memorial. We Sikhs have suffered 500 years of persecution. We want to build a national museum to tell the story of our people in our second holiest town. Please come to India. I'd like you to design it. So two weeks later, uh, I was in Anandpur Saab, which is an hour outside Chandigarh. And they took me there, and there's a temple, a small town of about 4,000 people, many officials. There was a convoy about 15 ambassador cars, those white official government cars that are in India. And we left the town and started driving and driving and driving and driving. And right down there, nine kilometers out of town, we all got out. There were flags. There were sort of chalk marks on the ground. And I was told, this is the site for a new national museum. And I sort of got very nervous. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I mean. Hundreds of thousands of people come to this place as pilgrims. They're all going to get into their trucks and buses and cars and schlep all the way down, nine kilometers down. <laughs> and I said, that won't do. And somebody grabbed me from the back and whispered in my ear, the land is owned by the chief priest. <laughs> and I guess I said, this is... Uh, this is the moment you either, you either stand by it or not. And I said, I'm sorry, this makes, does not make any sense. I have a proposal, I said. We should drive all the way back to the temple. Uh, we should get out of our cars. And anything we can find walking is legitimate. And so 15 cars, everybody gets in, bodyguards come all the way down here. We get out of our cars right by the fort. This is the fort where Guru Govind, the last guru who wrote the Khalsa, uh, fought his last battle. And we started walking down. We walked down through the valley. And I said, what's on top of the hill there? What's there? Oh, well, we've got to go all around to get up there. So we went all around. We got up there. And this was magical. This was a spot that looked completely over the entire temple and fort. 
sand cliffs rising, and I said, that's the spot. And as things go, in some places, three weeks later, the site was purchased by the government. And so, uh, here's the plan. Uh, the, the valley is being flooded into a series of water gardens. Uh, the museum of permanent exhibits where the story of the Sikh people is told will be on this side. The changing exhibition and auditorium and uh, library would be on this side, right by the fort. And a bridge, would, a pedestrian bridge, would cross the valley and connect them. And so you have the temple and the fort and the museum and the library all interconnected into one whole processional route. And so looking from the fort, you're looking across the valley, the bridge leading from town, uh, the historic museum growing out of the sand cliffs, built out of sandstone, its roof stainless steel reflecting towards the town and towards the temple and the series of ponds meandering right through. The Himalaya mountains are right there, not in the model, but in reality. And so the bridge and the walls rising, extending the sand cliffs, and again the roof reflecting light back towards the town. And the walls rising, fortress-like, in memory of the fort of Guru Govind and the story that was told there. And as you come from the mountains from the north, all we see is the walls and the bridge and the walls again, almost like a city wall that is hugging the town itself. So I came back a couple of months later for the groundbreaking, and lo and behold, they had made the 30 foot by 30 foot model of the whole complex. <laughs> Half a million people descended on the town. I was told that I managed to capture the spirit of Sikhism. Uh, I was uh, sort of converted. Uh, <laughs> I have my scarf and my bracelet. Elephants came in for the occasion. Airplanes sped confetti on the crowds. The warriors came down in procession. And I realized I better go and amend the plans. And I added lots of more toilets into the <laughs> museum. <laughs> And there you have it, the hill on which the museum will rise, and the warriors coming in, and the celebration going on. And then I came back a couple of months later, and I saw that though I was still making my plans and we haven't finished them, <laughs> volunteers have built the bridge. <laughs> and the museum will rise right there on top of this hill. I want to go back to Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem have decided two years ago that they are going to redesign the place. They've gone from a, they were designed for 300,000 visitors a year. It's now two and a half million. The museum in Washington has made it very difficult because uh, it is much more extensive. I'll, are you standing to tell me it's time? Oh, okay. So, uh, You'd think that, say, come work with us. No, they had a three-stage competition, first stage, second stage, third stage. Again, I felt the story of the Holocaust, the new historic museum, cannot be business as usual. It cannot be a building that sits on top of that hill. It cannot be galleries as we think about them. And my proposal was to cut right through the mountain, a kind of a prism that cuts through the mountain. It sticks at one end, it bursts out at the other, and the museum itself are the spaces under the hill. And the floor of the museum itself descends as you enter. And it descends and then starts rising. And as you go further and further down, you feel that you're going deeper and deeper in the earth. So from an entry building with services, you cross the bridge, enter the cantilevered end of this, and then go right through the mountain towards the north. Sticking out, entrance, and the plan as underground chambers unfold and you go through from chamber to chamber, cutting through. The prism going through 
meandering through the rooms and then returning to the mountain re-entering. So the central space itself, 18 meters high, the prism of concrete with light coming from above, and the chambers on either side. Uh, this is a stone quarry in Spain, uh, which I found very inspiring, very similar to the galleries. When the rock permits, it'll be the natural rock. When it is needs uh, reinforcing, it'll be walls. We come through to the north and then back. And here, towards the end, the prism or the spike burst out, opens uh, back to life, back to a sense of optimism, looking at the view of Jerusalem and the north. I'd like to just for a moment touch on the notion of beauty, which has been very much on my mind. And again, why is it on my mind? It's on my mind because it's a term we don't use very often. It's certainly not a term that is consciously used in reviews in schools of architecture. And I feel, I feel that the notion of beauty, the meaning of beauty, is central. Going back to, again, mathematics, Bernard Russell said in 1918, mathematics rightly viewed possesses not only truth but supreme beauty, a beauty cold and austere and capable of a stern perfection such as only the greatest art can show. What is the meaning of that? Uh, and let me go on with Hardy. Beauty is the first test. He's talking about mathematics. There is no permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics. Well, I guess you'll permit me to say there's no permanent place for ugly architecture. And I guess what I, I'd like to just elaborate for a moment what I mean by that, because it seems to me that beauty as used in that sense has to do with fitness, has to do with something being right. I guess I would dare use the word truthful. It has something to do with truth. It seems to me that it has to do with the making of it, the making of architecture. But above all, it seems to me, it has to do with the way in which architecture accommodates life. Lu Kahn, which Richard mentioned as our common mentor, used to say, what a building, let the building be what it wants to be. He personified that sense of the life in a building. I like to say the life, how does a building accommodate the life intended in a building? Uh, Darcy Thompson, who was the uh, inventor of morphology, used to say about morphology that it is about forms so concomitant with life that they seem controlled by life. It seems to me that to be said about architecture. Forms so concomitant with life that they seemingly are controlled by life, the life in the building. How do our buildings create place? And how do these places create a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, uplifting experience for those who live, work, and experience them? Uh, 20 years ago in a conference uh, Richard and I were together at, I wrote a little poem uh, which I thought still holds. And I'd like to conclude with it. He who seeks truth shall find beauty. He who seeks beauty shall find vanity. He who seeks order shall find gratification. He who seeks gratification shall be disappointed. He who considers himself the servant of his fellow being shall find the joy of self-expression. He who seeks self-expression shall fall into the pit of arrogance. Arrogance is incompatible with nature. Through nature, the nature of the universe, and the nature of man, we shall seek truth. If we seek truth, we shall find beauty. Thank you.